this day Christ our Lord is born in Bethlehem. Alleluia! The entire atmosphere of this glorious and joyous solemnity is summed up by the words of the angels to the shepherds in Luke 2, 10 to 14. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy that shall be to all the people. For this day is born to you a Savior who is Christ the Lord in the city of David. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the infant wrapped in swaddling clothes and laid in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly army, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to men of goodwill. Our Messiah, the long-awaited Redeemer of Israel, He is born. He has become man and has been born in the form of a helpless babe in Bethlehem. Bethlehem was a little village about five miles from Jerusalem. Bethlehem was the birthplace and home of Israel's greatest king, David. In Bethlehem was also kept the herds of sheep raised explicitly for a special daily temple sacrifice called the Tamid sacrifice. In fact, they were kept in the fields between Jerusalem and Bethlehem, literally midway between the temple and the city of David. The words Bethlehem in Hebrew mean house of bread. Today, Christ, the bread of life, has been born in this house of bread. This day, the son of David has been born in Bethlehem, the city of David. This day, the Lamb of God has been born in the city of the temple lambs. God truly cannot be outdone in poetic and typological perfection. Our God is incarnate. Our God has become flesh. This is a profound and almost scandalous teaching that is purely unique to Christianity. God chose to become lowly, to become like His creatures, to become one of us. Theology therefore tells us that God is not only infinitely transcendent, He is now wholly imminent. He is now truly Emmanuel, God with us. God remains eternally transcendent. We must strive to ascend to Him in grace, yet he is concurrently imminent, literally being among us, with us, and within us, that He might enable us to rise to Him. It is therefore true to say that in every Eucharistic celebration, where the faithful receive Christ in transubstantiation, Christ is born anew on the altar, becoming for us once again intimately imminent and still gloriously transcendent. In his homily on the Annunciation, St. Gregory of Neo Caesarea describes the significance of Christ's manger as follows. In the board from which the cattle eat was laid the heavenly bread, in order that he might provide participation in spiritual sustenance for men who live like the beasts of the earth. This feast is truly one of the most jubilant celebrations of the faithful. Christ, the Son of God, the second person of the eternal Trinity, became born of a virgin for the sake of the salvation and redemption of all mankind. About Christmas, St. Ephraim the Syrian says, a doctor of the church no less, it was he, the infant of days, that could appease, O Lord, the ancient of days. There's also a poetic aesthetic in the day of the celebration of Christ's birth. The solemnity of the birth of John the Baptist is celebrated in June during the traditional summer solstice. This, the longest day of the year, marks when the days of the year get shorter and shorter. Conversely, Christ's birth is celebrated on the traditional winter solstice. On this, the shortest day of the year, daylight increases with each passing day. Christians have long held the sun as a physical symbol of Christ, the radiant Son of the Father. 
Hence, this juxtaposition of the birth of Christ and John the Baptist become a physical representation of John's prophetic words, he must increase, but I must decrease. St. Gregory of Nyssa picks up this theme and writes, On this, the day which the Lord hath made, darkness decreases, light increases, and night is driven back again. No, brethren, it is not by chance, nor by any created will, that this natural change begins on the day when he shows himself in the brightness of his coming, which is the spiritual life of the world. It is nature revealing under this symbol a secret to them whose eye is quick enough to see it. To them, I mean, who are able to appreciate the circumstance of our Lord's coming. Nature seems to me to say, No, O man, that under the things which I show thee, there lie mysteries concealed. Has thou not seen the night that had grown so long suddenly checked? Learn hence that the black night of sin, which had got to its height by the accumulation of every guilty device, is this day its duration shall be shortened, until at length there shall be naught but light. Look, I pray thee, on the sun, and see how these rays are stronger, and his position higher in the heavens. Learn from that how the other light, the light of the gospel, is now shedding itself over the whole earth. The gospel writer also draws our attention to what Fulton Sheen calls the saddest words in all of scripture, that there was no room for them at the inn. These words should strike to the core of our hearts. God himself had become man and mankind refused to make room for his coming. I'm also repeatedly struck by the gospel writer's almost casual remark that there was no room for them at the inn. It is inevitable that we need to ask ourselves, have we made room for the Lord in our own hearts? If Jesus, Mary and Joseph were to knock upon the door of my own heart today, have I made worthy room for them? This day marked with so much joy and revelry must allow us to pause by necessity to ponder the proverbial reason for the season. Have we made room in our hearts for the Lord our God? Have we made space and time for Him? Will He find welcome within our souls? Far from being cliché, these are crucial moral questions. If we have walked in sanctifying and sacramental grace, we have striven to be friends of Christ and indeed, Christ is made truly welcome in our lives and homes. If we place created goods over the Creator, we turn our very hearts and souls away from God. We turn away from Him when we do not make time for God. Here, Pope Benedict's words ring ever true. The faster we can move, the more efficient our time-saving appliances become, the less time we have. And God, the question of God, never seems urgent. Our time is already completely full. But matters go deeper still. Does God actually have a place in our thinking? Our process of thinking is structured in such a way that He simply ought not to even exist. Even if He seems to knock at the door of our thinking, He has to be explained away. There is no room for Him. Not even in our feelings and desires is there any room for Him. We want ourselves. We want what we can seize hold of. We want happiness that is within our reach. We want our plans and purposes to succeed. We are so full of ourselves that there is no room left for God. And that means there is no room left for others either. For children, for the poor, for the stranger. That one phrase, there was no room for them at the end, evokes such profound introspection that if it doesn't, it truly should. As has been said, these words have struck the hearts of the church throughout her history. This Christmas season, amid our joyous revelry, let us bear at the forefront of our minds this fundamental splendor of truth. The astonishing reality that God has made Himself a child so that we may love Him, so that we may dare to love Him. 
Christ helplessly and trustingly allows for us to take him into our hearts as a babe is taken up in the arms of his mother. In Christmas, God is actively saying to us, I know that my glory frightens you and that you are trying to assert yourself in the face of my grandeur. So now I am coming to you as a child so that you can accept me and love me. This Christmas, let us take the time to truly search the innermost depths of our hearts, to weed out all that prevents the Lord from becoming welcome within our souls and our lives. Let us pray for the grace to be ever vigilant for God's presence in the greatest and the smallest of things. May our ears be opened to hear His gentle yet insistent knock at the door of our hearts. May our eyes be opened to behold His face and hand in others around us. May our minds be opened to understand how He speaks to us through others and the church. And may our hearts be opened that He may come and dwell as Lord and King within us. Have a blessed and joyous Christmas, dear brothers and sisters. From all of us here at Ave Maria Radio, I'm Marcus Peter. <music>